I wanted to talk some, about something called anger. And anger is something we struggle with. So my message tonight is called triggered. And uh, the, the, word, the word triggered, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. Like, I started hearing this word, for some of you that don't know, I, I also teach uh, eighth grade history and leadership at a task middle school down the street and love it. And my students earlier this year, I'm handing out a test and this one kid is kind of talking to another kid. And I'm like, hey, no talking during the test. And someone over there is like, Mr. Talbert's triggered. Yo, he's triggered right now. And I'm like, what? What does that mean? <laughs> and I was scared, you know, I was scared to, to, to know what that word meant. For the time, I had no idea. No idea what the word triggered actually meant. Uh, and I was scared to ask. Like, I didn't want it to be the, the whip and nene all over again. Like, for the longest time, I thought that the whip and nene was, like, that thing with the, uh, like, where you would actually take a whip and hit a horse. And, and my kids are, and this is true, they would walk in and be like, Mr. Talbert, you whip? I'm like, what? Like, why would I whip someone? Like, like you whip? Nene. <laughs> I'm like, what? I do I guess I'm like, I'm getting so old so fast. Like, and so this word triggered, I had no idea what it meant. And so I asked the student. I do what I tell my students to do when you don't know a word. Just ask someone. So I, I found the student that I thought would definitely know what the word triggered meant. And I was like, hey, I have no idea what this word is. Tell me. And he's like, dude, bro, it's just when you're getting crazy mad over something that's a, not that big of a deal. Like, you can go from super happy and then boom, triggered. Right? Like, I'm like, okay, okay. You know, maybe it's like that guy. I mean, like, look how angry he is. Like, someone probably ate his pineapple house. Or it might be like this lady. Like, look, she, she, she's just dealing with some Mike and Ikes, but then she notices the word Mike, and she doesn't like that Mike Wazowski guy. So she gets, boom, hashtag triggered. Or maybe it's this lady. Like, she's looking at Panda Express, but then Taylor Swift is reminded of her many exes. And she's triggered. There's, there's so many things that set us off, right? Like you could be perfectly happy going through your life and then one thing happens and your whole day's ruined. And the Bible actually says some things about anger. Because there's so many times where we think we're like going through our lives and we, we, we think that we've got it all together. And then there, there's everyone in this room has been angry. Everyone in this room has been mad about something. And I want to show you guys what the Bible says about anger. In Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, it says, Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. Now I want you to notice a couple things about this. It doesn't say when you get angry, you sin. It doesn't say anger is sin. It says in your anger, don't sin. And so the first thing I want you to understand about anger tonight is anger is not a sin. It's what you do with that anger that's important. And Paul makes it really clear how dangerous anger can be. He says, don't even let the sun go down while you're still angry. And this is a reference to something way earlier in the Bible, in the book of Psalms. If you look at it in your Bible, it looks like Psalms, because the P is silent. But in Psalms 4, verse 4, it says, while you're on your bed, don't think about your anger. And it says, don't let the sun go down when you're still angry. Don't let a day go by if you've wronged someone or been wronged before you resolve it. Why? Because anger can lead to sin. And it can give a foothold to the devil and can really destroy you. Anger can absolutely destroy you. But anger itself is not sin. See, Jesus got angry. We know that Jesus was without sin. And so what made Jesus angry? Well, there's multiple times in the Bible where Jesus gets angry over something. But I just want to look at one tonight. And this is uh, from the book of John. 
in John uh, chapter 2, if you have your Bibles or you're looking on your phone and you have your Bible app on your phone, if you want to look at John chapter 2, that's where we're going to spend just a minute here. Or you can just look on the screen. It says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem and the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he makes a whip out of courts and drove all from the temple courts, both the sheep and the cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers, overturned their tables. To those he sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. So the first thing I want you to notice is that Jesus walks into church and people are selling stuff in church. Now, it's not like if we're selling, like, tickets to the Slow Blues baseball game. Like, Jesus is not going to come in here and be like, stop selling baseball tickets, right? That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is people were selling stuff in the church to pay for sacrifices for people, which it would be like if I said, hey, give me $10. Since I'm a pastor, I'll pray a little harder for you, and you'll be forgiven. That's taking advantage of people. Jesus gets angry when people are taken advantage of. Jesus gets angry when people are broken. That upsets him. And the second thing I want you to notice, man, the dude just straight up makes a whip. He makes a whip. Like, not this kind of whip, you know? Like, but he, he actually creates a whip and then drives them out of the temple courts. Jesus took action, but it was righteous action because he was righteously angry. What actually happened here was an injustice. It was something that shouldn't have happened, and it was affecting broken people, and it was breaking people, and so Jesus took action on that. And there's a few other instances where he gets angry in the Bible, but the bottom line is he gets angry when people mistreat the poor, the hungry, the broken, and so what can we learn from Jesus getting angry? I think one thing we can learn is, is when you are triggered, or when you get angry, remember that it's not the anger that can be dangerous. It's what it leads to. Some anger, like what Jesus experienced, isn't sin. But anger can lead to sin if it's not held in check. So the big things that we can learn about anger, the first is when you are angry, watch out for revenge. When you are angry, watch out for revenge. There's this verse in the Bible that says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. In other words, it's not our job to get revenge on other people. Sometimes people hurt us, and they wrong us, and the first thing we want them to do, or want to do, is to get them back, right? When someone does something to us that really upsets us, we want them to pay for it. But the thing about revenge is it's never, ever, ever positive. It never ends well. And it always ends up leaving people more broken than they were when the event started. A lot of you guys are going up to Hume Lake with us uh, in a few weeks, which is exciting. And at Hume Lake, we have a policy with ABC. And the policy is absolutely no pranks. Period. No pranks. And I know you're like, oh man, but pranks... They're so fun, right? Like, and some of you guys are like, I had the best prank planned. I was going to put nails on someone's bed. <laughs> right? Like, see, that's the thing. Pranks escalate. And we have banned pranks because, well, among other reasons, they've never ended. Well, at one time, not, it was before I was a pastor. I was just a teacher, and I volunteered as a cabin leader at Hume Lake. And I'm there. A nice little meadow ranch with my cabin. And it started out, because I had seventh grade boys, started out, one kid brought a whoopee cushion. Classic. Puts it there. Ha ha, looked like he farted. Hysterical, right? Well, that made that kid upset. So what he did is he, he, he had brought a fake rat. So he puts the fake rat in the pillowcase. Okay. So then a kid screams, hits his head, or in the other cabin. So then, the other cabin comes to my cabin. They start wrapping all the luggage in saran wrap. I don't know how they got so much saran wrap. And so that upset my guys. So then what they did, now I didn't know this was going on. I apparently was a terrible cabin leader, right? Like, they, they then, my guys, go take the other kids' clothes. 
dry clothes, put them in the shower, and turn the water on. And kids, phones were in there, money, so stuff gets ruined. Then, then, my boys decided it would be, this is where I found out. It was not good. This is where I found out. I walk into my cabin, and we're about to have our deep cabin time discussion, and I turn, and I see this lump under the bed, and there's a blanket on I'm like, guys, what is that? And they're like, oh, nothing. Just a lump in the bed. I don't know where it came from. I'm like, wait, no, 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 there's, there's something. So I pull it back, and they had hogtied a sixth grader, and like at the fair, like where you would hog, they hogtied him and put him, and his mouth is duct tape. Where did they get the duct tape? Where are you guys bringing this stuff from? I, and so this prank just kept escalating and escalating and escalating. And so then a kid from the other cabin found out a kid's mom's phone number, called pretending to be Hume. He had a deep voice for an eighth grader. Um, <clears throat> pretended to be Hume and saying that the kid had done something inappropriate. And at that point, so what happened, I, ho I don't know if you saw this pattern of escalation, is that multiple kids' camp experience was ruined, completely ruined. Several of those students, to my knowledge, never went back to Hume. And it all started with this little whoopee cushion because the thing is when we take revenge, it never ends well. Now that was kind of a silly story because it didn't happen to us. Now you put yourself in the shoes of those kids that it happened to and you go, wait, like that would be super hurtful. And there's times in your life where you've had something happen to you and you might have taken revenge and then that person takes revenge back and it never ever ends well. So the second thing we need to be aware of is when we get angry, we need to take righteous action. The Bible doesn't say just sit there and do nothing. That's what we can learn from Jesus. Jesus didn't walk into the temple courts when everyone was selling that stuff and, and just really taking advantage of people. He didn't walk in and went, Jesus, angry, and just kind of pace, right? Like he took action. He saw an injustice, he saw something that was wrong, and he took action. And that's what we need to do. If we see an injustice, if we see someone do something wrong to someone else or hurt someone else, the Bible calls us to take righteous action. If there's something that seems like it's out of our control, maybe our action is to pray about it. That's a righteous action. If we're discouraged about some evil that's in the world, maybe our action is to read our Bible. Maybe our action is to give to a charity. The Bible calls us to take righteous action when we were angry. It might be, your righteous action might be to forgive the person that's hurt you. And that's really hard. That can be a very difficult thing to do, but the Bible says, when we are angry, we take righteous action. And the final point, the final thing we need to make sure that we do when we're angry is when we're angry, we need to watch out for bitterness. When we're angry, be careful of being bitter. You know, when I, I think of bitterness sometimes, uh, I think of this famous line from this movie, um, and I think we can all learn a lot from it. Let's take a look at this clip really fast. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Anger leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. By the way, if you actually want to suffer, you'll watch that movie. It's terrible. Like, just atrociously horrible. Like, we were watching 45 seconds of it, and we were panicked, and Jar Jar Binks wasn't even in that part. Right? Like, it's so bad. But the, the point is, shh. The point is, when we harbor this anger and we let it kind of grow, we don't make amends when we're angry. We don't, uh, we, we let the sun go down when we're still angry. It will fester into hate. And ultimately, it'll give us bitterness and a deep root of bitterness. And the bottom line is, usually, it's about someone that's really wronged us. 
Some of you in this room have had some really terrible things happen to you in your life. There have been adults who've hurt you. There have been friends who've hurt you. There's, you've been hurt by your environment. And sometimes it's the reaction is to want the people who have hurt us to pay. And sometimes it seems like they're not paying for it. And what happens is we let this bitterness grow and grow and grow. And the person who ends up being hurt is us. The person who ends up getting hurt over the anger that grows is us. Several years ago when I was in college, there was someone that I trusted that really, really hurt someone close to me and someone that I love. And uh, for this person's privacy, I'm not going to share the name, but really hurt this person in just a, a horrific way. And I remember being at Long Beach, which is about four hours away. That's where I went to college. And I got in my car, and in a blind rage, I just started driving back to the Central Coast. And I got about an hour up the freeway, fuming. And I was so angry, I couldn't see straight. I'm, luck I'm very fortunate I didn't get an accident. I'm so angry, and my hands are shaking at the wheel. And I get about an hour away, and I'm, I don't know what I was playing. I was so angry. I wanted to hunt this person down. I wanted to make him pay for what he did. And I'm driving and shaking, and I realized this isn't what God is calling me to. Revenge is mine, says the Lord. Vengeance is mine. So I start, I turn around, and I, and I couldn't even get back. I just pull over on the side of the road, and I just start sobbing, uh, just so broken over what had happened to this person that I loved. And some of you in this room, you've experienced, you know what I'm talking about. You've seen a horrible injustice happen, and it's broken you. And what I realized, it took me longer than I wanted to to realize this when I was a 20-year-old in college, is because I just let this anger grow against this person. And the person who ended up having trouble sleeping at night is me. The person who just was wrecked and pulled further away from God was me. And anger, when it's not directed towards righteous action, is always, always, always going to pull you further away from God. And I realized what I needed to do in that moment was to forgive this person. And that doesn't mean that I need to accept what that person did. That doesn't mean that I needed to ever speak to this person again. What it meant was I had to trust that God was in control of the situation. And I had to give him that. So I let go. I prayed. I said, God, I need you to help me with this bitterness. I need to let go. Some of you tonight may have someone in your life that you've got to forgive. Again, it doesn't mean that you accept what they've done. Some people have done some horrible things to you. It doesn't mean that you need to accept what they've done. It doesn't mean that you need to be okay with what they've done. It doesn't mean you need to let them back into your life. But if you find yourself harboring this bitterness and it's breaking you up inside, you might need to give that to God tonight. I'm going to invite the band up and they're going to play one more song and I want us to reflect on the words of this song. So if you're new here and you, you, you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm so glad you're here. I'd ask that you just look at the words on the screen. And if you're a Christian, you call yourself a Christian, and you're here tonight because you love Jesus, and I would look at the words on the screen and maybe sing along or maybe just meditate on what these words are and reflect on what is an action that I may need to take tonight. Because here's the bottom line. What really helped me forgive this person is that I had to realize all the injustices that I've done to God. And I want you to think for a second. Because when we sin, when we do our way instead of God's way, when we lie or cheat or steal, we are pulling ourselves away from God and we're committing injustice against him. 
God doesn't live in anger against us. He did the opposite. He forgave us in the most powerful display of love imaginable by dying for us so that we could be with him. Tonight, I want to ask you, and I want you to think about it, what have you done against God? Where is an area in your life where you need to turn back to him? And then you may need to think, who in my life can I forgive? Because if God forgave everything I've ever done and everything I ever will do, then I'm not going to let this anger control who I am anymore. I'm not going to be bitter. And I'm going to let it go.